Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this, I hope, I know, will be a wonderful conversation with our special guest, Doug Conant. He's here to receive the special Stephen R. Covey Award today. We'll be delighted to give that to him a little bit later. But for now, a chance for a conversation between us and a chance for you to ask a few questions, I hope. So I'm going to introduce him by reading the back of his book, which is a way of pointing the book out to you to say you, you need to get it. Uh, but on the back of the book, it says that Douglas Conant is the founder of Conant Leadership, former CEO of Campbell Soup Company, former president of Nabisco Foods. He shares transformational insights in this new book, The Blueprint. Conant is the only former Fortune 500 CEO who is a New York Times best-selling author, a top 50 leadership innovator, a top 100 leadership speaker, and a top 100 most influential author in the world. Wow. How do you stay human? <laughs> Actually, uh, my wife is right back there. That's a better question for her. Uh, <laughs> she can come up uh, and answer. I, 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 I do my best. Uh, I just do my best every day. That's about all I can do. You did, I'm sure you never sought to have all these accolades, but they've come along because of the brilliance of what you've done. Well, that's, that's very kind of you, but uh, you're, you're absolutely right. We never s sought it out. Uh, when my wife and I were first married, uh, we moved into a house. The, our house, our first house cost $38,500. And it was, we found it because it was for sale on a billboard in a grocery store. Uh, and uh, it was a wonderful house, and we had a wonderful life, but it, 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 we, we had no idea what this ride was going to look and feel like as we went on it. And 44 years later, we're still riding the wave and feeling incredibly, incredibly blessed. So, and, uh, you know, I, I think Brett, where are you, Brett? I know you're around here somewhere. You asked me on the way down if there was one thought I had about all the leadership work that I've done, and I... It just came out of my mouth. I have found throughout this whole journey, the more I give, the more I get. And it's not about the getting, it's about the giving. And it sounds so simple, but you know, you get caught up in, in, in your life and all the, 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 the craziness the of it. The pull. Yeah, yeah, the cockamamie life that I, I tend to talk about. And you begin to focus on your issues really to the exclusion of what's going on around you. And I, I fight that all the time. I try and just be tuned in. Uh, and uh, I, the more you give, the more you get. That's it. You're a man defined by purpose. It's very clear. Yeah, yeah. All who know you can feel that when they meet you. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to read you his purpose, which is stated in your online site. Your purpose is to help build high trust, high performance teams that honor people, defy the critics, and thrive in the face of adversity. You put honor people first. Yeah, and you know where I first encountered that language was with a good friend of several of ours here, Blaine Lee, when he wrote the book The Power Principle, and it was all about influence with honor. And uh, he spoke about it so eloquently. Uh, it, it, it was so moving to me, and I've carried that with me ever since, and that was over 30 years ago that I heard that language and had these conversations with Blaine, and it, it just resonated with me. You know, you hear someone just say the right thing at the right time, and it just connects with you deeply. Uh, that concept did, and the whole notion of the power principle, and basically you have three ways to influence people. You can either do it in a way that is challenging and uh, depleting. Uh, you do this or else. Or you can do it in a transactional way. If you do this, I'll pay you a quarter. That's basically pay for performance, which is what the corporate world is sort of built on. Or the third way was you can do it by honoring them. And uh, I voted for the third way, and I've been doing it that way ever since. And one of the special things you did at Campbell's Soup, you did was you wrote to people, didn't you, all the time? <laughs> yeah, uh, we have enough time. I'm gonna tell a, 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 longer, a longer than two minute story. I was fired from a job once and uh, 
my outplacement counselor. I'm going to talk a little bit about this at lunch. So if some of you are there, I'll, I'll save some of the good stuff for the lunch. But uh, my outplacement counselor was just a crusty old New Englander. And he was preparing me to go out and interview. He said, Doug, you're going to be a, you may never get a job. You're a terrible interview, which I am. Uh, and uh, he, I, I was very much of an introvert. I was shell-shocked from losing my job. And I had a mortgage to pay and a family to take care of. And it's like, what am I going to do? I felt like uh, a deer in the headlights. And so I was sort of saying whatever someone wanted me to say in order to get a job. And uh, he said, you know, I've come to know you well. And the way you present yourself and the person you are are two different people. Uh, you need to find a way to step out of your comfort zone and express who you are. And you need to find a way to be distinctive if you're going to get a job. Uh, I kept trying to be a better interviewer. I'm just not. And uh, so I thought, well, I, I better be distinctive. And I started, if I was coming to the Huntsman School and I was interviewing for a job and I met seven people during the day, including the receptionist, wherever it was at the front of the building, I would get their name, I would get all the names, and as soon as I finished the day, I would walk next door to the coffee shop and I would handwrite a note to each and every person that was kind enough to help me that day. I would then take it back to the reception desk and I'd say, could you deliver these handwritten thank you notes to all these people today? Now, first of all, the receptionist had never gotten a thank you note, yeah. never. And, and then and they were so flattered, they would go deliver them to everyone. And, uh, and I had a chance, because I was an introvert, I had a chance to sit there and think, what did I want to say to these people in a few sentences to thank them for their help? And I was able to express myself the way I wanted to and didn't have to do it in person, which was good. And they started delivering them. And the next time I would go back for an interview, the receptionist was like over the moon to see me. It's like, oh, you're back. Great. Who are you seeing today? Oh, you better watch out for this Anderson fellow. He's a little strange. <laughs> Wherever you are, Doug. Oh, there. Sorry. Uh, but he's had a bad day. You better, or whatever it was, the receptionist was there to help. Everybody was there to help me the next time around. I started doing that when I went to Campbell Soup Company. Uh, I, I thought, well, we have, we have operations in 38 countries. I'm not going to get to all these people, but I want them to know I'm paying attention and that I value their contributions. So every day on the portal, they would print out all the stuff that was going on that day. And I had a two and a half hour commute to and from work every day. And on the way home, I would read it all. On the way in, I would write 10 to 20 notes a day celebrating contributions of significance to the company and thanking people for delivering them. And uh, I did it actually six days a week, once on the weekend. And uh, when I retired, I was being interviewed by a magazine. And they said, uh, we heard you write a lot of notes. I said, yeah, I write 10 to 20 a day. I've done it six days a week for 10 years. They said, well, how many have you written? I said, I don't know. Let's figure it out. We got the calculator out. And we figured out I'd written over 30,000 notes to Campbell employees. And... Uh, plus a host of other people. And we only had 25,000 employees. So wherever you went in to Papua New Guinea or Sydney, Australia or Paris, France, you walked through the offices and you saw these little handwritten notes from me posted in all the cubicles. Uh, it said a few things. It said, we appreciate you. I was honored to be serving with you and that I was paying attention, and I was celebrating the work that was being done, which was important to the success of the company. And uh, it, little did I know when I was writing these little notes that this would be one of the first questions I would get whenever I was interviewed. Uh, and it became the hallmark of what I did. I guess it's because it's a tangible practice that yes. people can get and connect yes. with. Yeah. But... Uh, it was uh, life-changing. I did it well, just a post note script. Uh, my mother, who tried to get me to write thank you notes after I got my Christmas presents every year, I was like pulling teeth to get myself or my brothers to write thank you notes. You probably know that, David. You know what I'm talking about. And uh, 
Uh, and we weren't allowed to play with our Christmas presents. So we'd pretend to write the notes, and then we would play with our presents. And then she would find out we didn't really write the notes, and we'd get in trouble, but we'd still have played with our presents. We won. But uh, <laughs> I was, uh, she was retired living in a nursing home in Asheville, North Carolina, and they asked me to come to speak to the staff. There were about 100 people there. And they invited her to come, and this thank you note thing came up. And she brought down the house. It was in a, a room actually larger than this. And uh, she, she stood up. She was about 90 at the time and, uh, and said, you owe all of that success to me. <laughs> and uh, she, she said, you were always slow, though. It took you a long time. And I'm surprised it took until you were 40 to figure it out. But uh, my mother was right. So would you, would you say that your because you do a lot of teaching and yeah. thinking about leadership, but did you learn your best leadership instincts from your mother, from your family, from your community, rather than from courses and universities? Well, I love courses and universities because yeah. I've done that work now for the last decade. But uh, uh, I believe the leadership lessons you learn are largely personal. Uh, their experiences. And uh, at lunch, I'm, we're going to do a little exercise with everybody there, and we're going to talk about that. But um, uh, I, I think your, I believe your life story is your leadership story, and we talk about that in the book. If you mine the tapestry of your life, you, you know, largely we experience life by the seat of our pants, which is sort of, there's a lot coming at us, right? We have those experiences. And, and then we put those experiences in the parking lot. And we deal with the next set of experiences that are coming at us. There's so much to be learned by examining that parking lot as you, as you grow. And believe me, embedded in that parking lot are the lessons that are influencing you today. You need to better understand them and study them. So I'm a big believer that your life story is your leadership story. Uh, in the blueprint, I talk about the first step after you envision kind of what you want to do, what your purpose is, is to reflect on your life and harvest all those learnings. That's not enough, though. Then you have to study the world around you and learn from the broader world, too. You integrate your purpose, your reflections, and your study, and then you've got something that will help you shape your purpose-driven approach to, to leadership. One other thing on leadership. Look, I believe it is sacred ground. Leadership is sacred ground. Uh, if you're a leader, either formal or informal, the people working for and with you are spending more time either working at, on the work or thinking about doing the work. You think about it, they work all day. Uh, harder to measure that when it's virtual and remote, but fundamentally, they're working all day. They spend some family time or walk the dog. They have dinner, and then they're, what are they doing at night? They're on email working all night. And then they go to sleep thinking about, what do I have to do the next day? And then they wake up thinking about, what do I have to do today, and how am I going to get ready to go do it? Uh, and you have influence over that. Think about the leaders who have influenced influencing or who are influencing your life. And to me, uh, that's important stuff. And as a leader, you need to treat that as sacred ground. And when you start doing that, when you start thinking about it that way, not when you, when I start thinking about it that way, that's when honoring people, because it's sacred ground, becomes what motivates me. So the, the, this, this leadership thing is not meant to be taken lightly. You know, a, a Donald Trump on the old television show, The Apprentice, you're fired. That's not life. That's not life. That's not honoring people. And uh, uh, that's, that's what I'm about. And I believe, as I've dealt with thousands of people over the years, people hunger to be that way. It's not like they're out to be, uh, to be, more challenging and more difficult. They hunger to do that. They just need to find a way that works for them. You have a, a, a wonderfully 
kind demeanor about you, but a hugely effective way of being an executive and a leader. But, but you've also gone through almost oh near tragedy and pain. Just, just help us understand well, how you nearly lost everything. I, I will in a second. But I will tell you, this leadership journey is not for the faint of heart. I don't care if it's your family, your community, your work. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, these are difficult problems. We have to be very tough-minded in dealing with them. But we also have to be tender-hearted. And this notion of being tough-minded on standards and tender-hearted with people is at the heart of my personal belief system that grew out of my life story. And, uh, uh, and so this, this, it's not for the faint of heart. Now I'll, 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 we'll get more into that, but going to that particular story, uh, I'm glad my wife's here, actually, for this one. Uh, I'm glad she was there when I needed her most, which will become apparent in a minute. Uh, July 2, 2009, our daughter was uh, just starting her career. She had just graduated from Northwestern University, was starting her career uh, working in Washington, D.C., staying at, I think, the M Hotel. Uh, wasn't that it? I think it was. And... Uh, uh, with and my wife was down there helping her move in with her girlfriend and her girlfriend's mother and they were found their place on P Street uh, near Logan Circle and uh, they were getting ready to move in and I was being driven home from uh, work at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday before the 4th of July weekend I was going back to where we lived and then I was coming down to Washington to pick them up and then we were going to spend some t family time together and uh, I dozed off in the back of the car, and we were on the New Jersey Turnpike. Um, anybody ever watch The Sopranos? It's sort of it, it, that's sort of the New Jersey Turnpike. Uh, and uh, and for the Fourth of July weekend, everybody is racing to get to the shore. They're all driving too fast. It's like the Indy 500. The exit ramps are short, so it backs up onto the highway when people are trying to exit. And uh, uh, I dozed off in the back seat, had my seatbelt on. Uh, unfortunately, my driver dozed off in the front seat. And uh, we were going between 70 and 80 miles an hour. And we ran into the back of a stopped dump truck, a large stopped dump truck. Uh, the airbag deployed from my driver, and he was actually able to walk away from the accident. I was not so lucky. Um, they had to uh, cut me out of the car and take me to a trauma center. I had uh, many broken bones and internal life-threatening injuries. Uh, uh, my typical line on this story is that I am living proof you can put Humpty Dumpty back together again, <laughs> which is why I wear these things all the time. It would be very ugly if I didn't have them on. And uh, so uh, uh, at any rate, uh, they rushed me to the Audrey Fold Trauma Center in Trenton, New Jersey, I want to say, honey. I think that's it. They got a hold of my wife. I was alert enough to sign the form to operate, but uh, that's all I remembered. I was in surgery for what seemed like days. It was 12, 16 hours, something like that. Um, and uh, they had to put me back together again. They tracked my wife down in Washington, D.C., got her up to the... Uh, uh, Audrey Fold Trauma Center. She has a great story about having to wait there forever because they lost track of where she was. Ultimately, she found her way in, and I was in the ICU, tubes coming out of me everywhere. And uh, uh, I'm sort of squirmish with this, squeamish with blood and hospitals. This was not the best place for me. Uh, but I did discover drugs. Drugs can be your friend. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but at any rate, I was, I was out of it, and Lee, my wife Lee, was, be, was sitting next to me holding my hand. Now, she could probably tell this story better than I could because I was asleep, but from what I understood from the nurses later on, she was sitting there for hours waiting for me to wake up. And they would say to her, don't you want to take a comfort break? I'll be right here with them. And she was determined to be there for me when I woke up. 
uh, thank God. And so uh, she, I woke up and she was holding my hand. And she just said two, wor- two words. I was on drugs. Three words, two? Two. I can't see back on the lights. Three? Okay. She said three words. Uh, she said, I'm right here. And it was what I needed to hear. She was there for me. She was there for me completely. And I was not alone. I'm right here. And uh, uh, it was uh, a powerful emotional moment. And when I use that, when I go through this talk, I often talk about uh, uh, the people we travel with, the people in your classes, the people you work with right here in school are metaphorically in a car accident every day. Something's gone wrong. I mean, you all know what I'm talking about. Everything's complicated. Something's gone wrong. And what I encourage them to do is basically adopt that mindset for the people with whom they're traveling and say, I'm right here. I'm here for you. How can I help? And uh, if you think in terms of, I'm right here, how can I help? honoring people, and being on a journey with a purpose, all of a sudden, and I'll talk about this at lunch, you've got your rudder in the water, and everything else will follow. So that's my story. And then I I tried to be a CEO for two more years. It was very hard work because I required five or six surgeries after that, so I was in and out of the hospital. And finally, enough was enough, and after uh, a decade, I retired uh, as CEO of Campbell Soup Company. Interesting postscript. When I retired, we had this event in, in the building, and uh, the employees uh, did a thank you video for me, thanking me for sending all of them thank you notes. And it's actually on my website at Kona Leadership. I choke up every time I see it. It runs for about eight or nine minutes. And it's employee after employee after employee from all around the world thanking me for writing them the thank you note and saying how meaningful it was. So uh, the other thought here is what goes around comes around. Thank you for telling us that. Thank you. In your book, you you set out your six guiding principles. Mm -hmm. Um, Number one, reach high in vision. Number two, dig deep. Reflect. Three, lay the groundwork, study. Number four, design and plan. Five, build and practice. Six, reinforce and improve. So just pick out of that the one that you, you think about the most. Well, it all matters. And, you know, if you think about it, this is my version of Rudder in the Water. Seven Habits was Stephen's version of Rudder in the Water. Uh, reflecting and and all that and uh, being becoming purpose driven was being proactive and beginning with the end in mind right and then putting first things first was getting your plan figuring out what you want to do and then yeah. then uh, making it happen uh, so it's and and sharpening the saw is all about continuous improvement mm. knowing that you'll never get it all right the first time you do it uh, so if if you don't if you know seven habits you've gone a long way to understanding what's in the blueprint. But the big issue I see today is that we get the concepts, but we don't bring them to life in real, in, in, in action. You know, people go to leadership development courses, they get all these things, and then they go back and lead the life that they led yes. before. Yeah. Or they, they're well-intentioned, they may even do it for a month or two. I did it, I've taken, as many leadership courses, probably more than anybody else. Uh, And I would do it for a couple months, but it it never worked. And the key in the blueprint is you have to figure out how are you going to engineer what I call practices into your cockamamie life that that are going to be sustainable for you. In other words, they have to be small practices. Uh, James Clear has done a beautiful job of writing the book of our generation on practices. It's called Atomic Habits. And, uh, and he talks about the compound interest of doing little things 
consistently over time and, and reaping big rewards from them. I'll give you an example. Uh, so practices is the one to focus on. How do you bring your intentions to life? You've got to be intentional, but how do you bring them to life? My, I have this habit of how can I help that I bring to every engagement. That's a practice. That's a practice. Uh, I uh, had a little practice at work. I, meeting after meeting after meeting, you just go crazy. I had a practice just, we had a meeting center where most of the meetings were. Between meetings, I would go very intentionally. I'd walk around this, there was a center conference room. I'd go walk around. It took about a minute. I would catch my breath. I would, I would reflect on what had we just decided, and I would prepare myself for the next meeting. So when I walked into that meeting, I had cleared my head, and I was able to be there completely for the next meeting. Anybody who's worked in a corporate office knows that it's sheer chaos in there. Got to do this, that, and the other thing. But I found the discipline of actually sticking to a schedule and, and then honoring people by clearing my head and being able to show up for them completely. Just a simple little habit. A minute. Uh, changed the way uh, I engaged with people. So these small practices will make big differences. That being said, they need to be linked back to how you want to show up as the best version of yourself as a leader. They're not just pick, pick my practices, pick yours. How do I want to show up as a leader, which is what the first four steps are there, and figure that out, knowing that it'll be wrong, but it'll be mostly right, and, and then develop practices that really speak to the important things that you want to bring to your relationships and your engagements and make them so small that you have no excuse for not doing them. We all tend to, this is my big chance to change my life. And so we create these monstrous Overwhelming things. practices. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be a different person. And yeah. oh, no, you're not. You know, life has a way of reminding you that, hey, I'm in charge. And, and you're going to have to find a way to fit your practices into what's going on around you. So practices, is, if I had to pick one, is the most important thing. So now is your chance to ask a question, make a comment. Um, preferably our students first. And if the students don't offer, then we'll go to the, the, the more aged in the room. Um, who wants to go first? Do you want to... Do you want to Somebody over there? Yes, there's a lady back there. Just say who you are and then ask away. Uh, my name's Casey Larson. Um, I was just wondering. Oh, Casey, I, I met you last yes, night. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, so I know pivoting can be super important. You kind of said um, know that like your decisions will be wrong, but mostly right. We're never completely right at the very beginning on what our life track will be. What was the biggest pivot that you made, and how do you think it changed your life? What would your life be like if you hadn't made that pivot? The biggest pivot? You're not messing around. I, 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 I uh, you know, a uh, mutual friend of Stephen M. R.'s and mine, Jim Collins, uh, talked about the distinct, uh, when he wrote uh, Good to Great, which I believe is still the best-selling business book of all time, uh, he found two characteristics of leaders that astounded him. He thought he was going to find all these high-flying, Elon Musk-type people had built these amazing companies that were defying the critics. Well, the way he measured it was longer over time, over decades. But he found the two distinguishing characteristics of these leaders were humility, and uh, what he called at times fierce resolve or perseverance. And uh, I found the power of humility to be the single most important thing. I never assumed I had the right answer. I, I, I tried not to. And uh, for the most part, I had that practice of, uh, I realized that all of us are smarter than one of us. And uh, so I was always looking to learn and, uh, and as I looked to learn, I, uh, I found uh, that I could, well, basically I was acknowledging I didn't have all the answers and it was quite all right for me to, uh, to probe and learn from the people around me. So I, I focused on the learning 
In the book, I also talk about leading by listening. Uh, Stephen would talk about it as seek first to understand, then to be understood. But uh, I'd like to focus on the listening part and listening intently, uh, which is why I was taking that walk around before I had a meeting, because I wanted to be fully present. And uh, so uh, I found the way to lead was by listening. Uh, you talked yesterday about, you know, some, most people think about, uh, as a leader, your job is to push forward. Yeah, yeah. And actually, your job is to pull people along with you. Yeah. And uh, I, focused, uh, I focused on them more than I focused on me. And I grew from that experience every time. And I felt better for it. So that would be the pivot I would suggest you think about. Anyone else? OK, let's take right here. And then we'll come over here. Patrick. Hey, what's up, man? Hey. <laughs> um, I know this guy, too. I don't know many people at Utah State, but I've just talked to two <laughs> of the five. So. Um, so my question is, you know, obviously, you talk a lot about doing the right thing when you're talking with uh, your employees, right, and being there yeah. for them. Can you name an experience where you did the right thing, you knew it was the right thing, maybe you got a lot of backlash for it? Sure. Um, how did you overcome that adversity? Like, how did you handle that? Hey, uh, you know, earlier we talked about being tough-minded on standards and tender-hearted with people. I'm, a, I'm pretty well-known as being a likable fellow, uh, generally kind. I try to be. But, you know, I turned over 200 of the, I mean, 300 of the top 350 leaders at Campbell Soup Company in the first three years. 300 out of 350. To my knowledge, that's never happened in a Fortune 500 company. You know, six out of seven over three years. Uh, you also have to be tough-minded uh, because there's a greater good. I'm, I've got, you know, the 300 out of 350, well, I had 25,000 other people who were counting on good leadership, and we weren't providing it. We gave those leaders uh, three years to, to buy into the approach we were taking and start to evidence a commitment to it, and we had metrics and things we followed with it. And, uh, and if, if they weren't able to keep up with it, we had to make the tough call. And what was interesting to me was we tracked maniacally employee engagement. And look, I had never, when I took that job, I had never been a CEO before, but I had a sense of what the right thing to do was. You know, Jim Collins, in Good to Great, the first thing he says is, uh, it's first two, then what? It's get the right people on the bus before you take the bus anywhere. And so we needed to get the right people on the bus in order, in service to our shareholders and all the rest of our employees. But we needed to honor them, right? I had to honor them. The way we treated them was going to be the litmus test that all the rest of the employees were going to look at us and say, what is this honoring people thing? So we gave them three years. We gave them feedback. We talked about what needed to be done, and if they couldn't do it, we were going to try and find another place for them, or we were going to help them leave the company. About half of those 300 that turned over self-selected out, but we had to terminate about another 150 people over, over at the end of the year two and year three. Uh, tough stuff, but we tried to do it with honor. Was, wasn't perfect. I mean, we had a few gigantic screw-ups. But I have to say, I believe the employees gave us the benefit of the out because our, uh, the benefit of the doubt because our intentions were so clear and our practices were so clear that we were going to honor people even as they exited the organization. Uh, uh, so we did the right thing. We did the tough thing. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't easy. We did promote, of the 300, we did promote 150 from within, people who were dying to contribute more but weren't getting the opportunity. And, uh, but then we had to go out and hire 150 more, which was quite an adventure for a guy who'd never been a CEO before. I mean, this is a little colloquial, but I did not know my ass from my elbow as a CEO. I had, uh, Stephen M. R. knows what I'm talking about. You get the chair, and you've done everything there is to be prepared to sit in that chair, but you never sat in it before. And once you sit in it, 
uh, <laughs> it, it comes roaring at you, uh, the responsibility you have to do the right thing and to honor all the stakeholders. This is not, that's not an easy job. So, anyway. Gentleman there in the blue. Yeah. yeah. And then we'll go for someone over here. We've got little boy blue there, and I haven't met you, so. Well, actually, you came and uh, ate at Elements last night, and I saw you all sitting at the table. So it's so, <laughs> it's so cool that you're now. <laughs> I do know you, but I didn't meet you. Yeah, so I We was, didn't uh, get introduced. I didn't, I didn't realize right. I'd be yeah, here today. I had a very good steak salad, and the French onion soup <laughs> so glad was to hear delicious. It. I'll be sure to tell the chef. All right. Um, so as far as my question, I found your insight as uh, far as sort of the incremental um, breaking sort of little, making small attainable goals, the, the pursuit sort of, you know, it's, we often try and set goals that are way much, much larger than we can really comprehend. And so along those lines, I was curious as far as setting goals for your, in, in your own experience, did you say I one day will become sort of did you have a picture of where you'd be, where you'd go, or is it the small pursuit of those, those self goals of self improvement that led you to eventually be coming to where you got to? Yeah, I think I understand your question. Um, I, I'm gonna in college. If I ever really wanted a date, I could never get one. The harder I tried, never worked. And then as soon as I said, I give up, I met my wife. She was trying out for the Delta Gamma girls powder puff football team, of which I was a coach. And uh, <laughs> I don't know, in today's world, that could be viewed rather negatively, gender, anyway. Uh, <laughs> coach, player. But she, she, she became, I was the defensive coach, she became my defensive end. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and she was great. And, uh, but we became friends first, and uh, the friendship blossomed into something that is now 44 years of, of marriage. Uh, what I found was, I did have this goal, I said I wanna be a CEO by the time I'm 50. And believe it or not, I became a CEO when I was 49. But I said that when I was like 25. I said a lot of stupid things when I was 25. Uh, but I was an introvert, so I didn't say them out loud too often. Uh, but um, uh, what I found is, as, as I advanced in my career, the less I focused on that and the more I focused on helping, the better I did. I let go of all that stuff. And I was just on a journey traveling with people, uh, trying to do a little better today than we did yesterday. And the more I focused on just trying to be in the moment and be helpful, we did it strategically. We had long-term views and visions and plans. But the more I focused on just trying to be helpful, the better I did. And I would have told you I never would have been a CEO because I was... I didn't fit the mold, but uh, lo and behold, I did. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I would say just give yourself over to the process of being helpful. Easy to say, hard to do. Give yourself over to the process, be helpful, and the rest will take care of itself. I can say that because I don't have to do that much anymore. So I know that. Over here, who would like to go? Right at the back, I think this. There we go. In the light blue, I think it is. Hi, I'm Jacob Semendeni. Um, so I had a question in regards to leadership. When you were a CEO, how did you find the time to like still like be a leader with like your family, like in your personal life, while you were taking care of like two, like twenty thousand plus employees, being that leader for them? Like, how are you still able to be like a leader with your wife and your family? God, the ghost of Stephen Covey is. <laughs> <laughs> looking down on me right now, saying, Doug, things that matter most must never be at the mercy of things that matter least. There, it's easy to say no to things if there's a greater yes burning within. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, oh, man. 
I, I buy into all that stuff. And uh, as a leader, you know, uh, when you're a CEO, MR, you can relate to this, out of a thousand decisions made in the enterprise at any one time, you're not in the room for 999 of them. You're not. And by the time you hear about them, they're going to sound like they made perfect sense, even if they didn't, right? You are totally dependent on the people with whom you work to have the enterprise thrive. Uh, I found it was awfully important. You know, I had probably, I had, depending point in time, 12 direct reports. Uh, but we had a leadership team of maybe 30 that really influenced the direction of the company. We all had to be on the same page. And if we were on the same page, we did just fine, thank you very much. We had to be tethered to a higher purpose that was going to override any strategy changes we had to make or any difficult tactics. We had to be tethered to a higher purpose. But then I could let these people go because I trusted them. And as Stephen M. R. knows, trust, it's all about character and competence. And I had, I had I, I'd been very careful with the way we constructed the team, which is very important. And, uh, and then everything else would fall into place. I was pretty disciplined on my life journey. The, the tough thing for us was that I had such a darn long commute every day. You know, I was in the car four to five hours a day when I was doing that. That was tough. And, uh, and plus, my wife's a saint. I would say that even if she wasn't here. Uh, she, she was amazing with our three children uh, as they were growing up. But I think she, uh, I shouldn't say, I, I think she or any of our three children would tell you that I was there for them. And I found ways that I could be there. Uh, we spend our summers uh, at a summer home. Uh, I'd, I'd go there every weekend, which was halfway across the country. I'd fly there on a Friday, go back on a Sunday or a Monday. And on the way back every time, I would write each of them a note. I put money in it so they would open the note. <laughs> I was able to start with a dollar. It started to go up as they were growing up. And uh, I, with the thought I had for each of them, those notes would be mailed Federal Express the day I got back to the office. And so I was doing little things like that to keep my presence felt uh, as much as I could all the time. We, you just have to figure out what matters most. And, uh, I, and by the way, oh, and I also did my mission statement with Stephen, which was uh, hilarious. I, I shared this yesterday, I think. Uh, but. I did. I, I went to Sundance, and I did my mission statement with him. And he said, "I want you to take it home and show it to your wife." And so uh, I did. And then I went. I didn't. I took it home. But then I went back the next year, and, and Stephen said, "Well, what did your wife think about it?" And I said, "Well, I haven't showed it to her yet. I'm still working on it. I want to make sure it's just right." And he implored me to take it home and share it with her, which I did year two. And uh, it, it really it sort of catalyzed. It took our relationship to a different place. But uh, the, uh, in there, I was really careful about the roles that were important to me in my life. And I developed practices around every one of those roles so that I was being there as, full as, I, as fully as I could be, given that there, were, I think, were five or six roles. I actually have a copy, that, a hard copy of it in my backpack right here with me. And I still visit it, and I wrote it 30 years ago. So you've got to figure out what matters most, and then you need to put first things first. Sound familiar? <laughs> so, wonderful man, great leadership Thank example, you. tender hearted, intensely wise, kind. Tough-minded. I, I was getting don't, to that. You've you got to be tough. <laughs> Tough-minded. I mean, hey, all the people he sacked. Yeah, I mean. you got to be t You don't have the job for very long. you got three years yeah. in a job. The first year, it's the other guy's fault. The next year, we're learning. The third year, you own it. You have to get it right. Uh, so you do have to be tough, too. Well, thank you for being all a right. blueprint of life. <laughs> there Join you go. Join me in thanking. Thank Doug you. Clark.